Welcome to the Steady On Podcast, where God's hard truth meets your hard story. I don't need to tell you that life gets hard. Life gets hard, really hard. But God's faithfulness is still active and alive in our hard. And these episodes are dedicated to remembering and claiming the promises of a faithful God. I'm your host, Angie Bauman. I'm a pastor and Bible teacher, founder of Steady On Ministries, and creator of the Step-by-Step Bible Study Method. But more than that, I'm a trauma and abuse survivor who carried a heavy weight of shame and worthlessness for many years, and I still struggle, but I live in much more freedom now because I know God through His Word and speak truth to the lies of the enemy with His Word. And that's what we do here. On Mondays, we take it in by studying the promises of God, And on Wednesdays, we live it out with teaching and testimony on the promises of God. So thank you for tuning in, my friend. You are the reason for this show, and I'm so very, very glad you are here. Let's get started. Hello there, and welcome into what I believe will be an incredibly encouraging conversation today between me and my guest, speaker, author, missionary, and podcaster, Sue Coral. Sue is an international speaker who spends a lot of time ministering to people of different cultures. She shares her story of living in freedom because what she understands is the bondage of rejection and trauma knows no language. Sue was born with a cleft palate and spent years on a medical journey to help correct it. Through that journey, she also found herself on another path, one that invited her to take steps towards understanding how to believe in and feel her beauty. Our verse this week is Isaiah 61, 3, the first part of it. Hear it in the NLT. To all who mourn in Israel, he will give a crown of beauty for ashes. It's so easy to see the ashes of our lives. But Sue's message today is an example of how we can have faith that God has, is, and will replace the ashes with things of beauty. Let's listen in. Sue, Welcome to the Steady On community. Thanks, Angie. It's great to be here. I'm excited to have this conversation because I will say when I was looking over some of the things that you talk about and share and some of the life work and the ministry work you've done, it, I had a hard time picking some of the questions I was going to ask you because you, <laughs> you are a woman that's done a lot of things, but we're going to talk mostly mm-hmm. about living free um, mm-hmm. and being released from the bondage that holds you, which is uh, as those who are regular listeners here know that's the kind of thing that really resonates with me because I am someone who lived under a heavy blanket, I sometimes call it, of shame and condemnation and change to things in my past for a very, very long time. Still struggle with that to a certain degree, but I know a lot more now about how to fight and talk to the lies of the enemy and and live free. But I want to I want to hear from you. I read first of all that your your ministry has really kind of started uh, with an act of faith because God asked you to sort of prepare some messages for a conference that didn't exist. Do I have that right? Will you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, you have it right. Uh, I was living in China at the time. I've been there already for several years. And I had a ministry where I was mentoring leaders around the country, uh, both local and foreign. And I loved that. I love mentoring women, but I really wasn't having opportunity to teach. And so I'm on a bus and I'm complaining a bit, I'll be honest, to God and, and saying, Lord, you gave me this gift and I'm not getting to use it. And granted, I'm in China, so it's not like you can just publicly pull together hundreds of people, but you know, I'm still new. That was a gift he'd given me. And so I was like, Lord, I want to use that gift. And I was being kind of whiny, Angie, I'll admit. (laughs) But right when I said that, I heard in my spirit clearly from the Lord, you write the messages and I'll bring the people. And I was just shocked. I'm like crowded in with probably a hundred people jammed in this bus. You don't even have seats over there. You're just standing and holding on for dear life. And I said, but nobody's invited me to, to speak. And he said, you write it. I'll bring the people. He said it again. So I said, well, what do I write about? And he said, your story. And that's all he would say. And unfortunately, I didn't jump right into it because I have very young kids and I kept getting distracted with life and my job and all that, my ministry. But after, when uh, September came along and I did my annual, what do I do this year, Lord, get away, uh, I, I said the question, I wrote it in journal and he said, and I heard, I already told you, mm-hmm. do it. 
or I'm going to take this opportunity away. So, it, you know, usually God is just so like sweet and calm and patient, but he wasn't like that. <laughs> I was like, oh my goodness. I know that sounds strange, but sometimes that that word in your spirit is, is like a voice in your head. You know, it's so loud. And so I put a, I set aside Mondays. I got a babysitter and um, I started writing. And when I finished, a few days later, the ch my church, which was an international church, had asked me just to share briefly a little bit of my testimony. Not like what I'd written about, but like that. And I did. And afterwards, this woman comes up. I'd never seen her she said, I know I'm new here, but I'm an event planner and I love your speaking and I will plan a conference for you if you're willing to do it. And, and she is just like a few days after I, I finished. And then a local gal came up that I knew well, and she said, would you share your story in, in my um, house church? And so that launched it. And and then it was no turning back because that local gal joined me and she had connections all over the country. So she kept me quite busy. But I did that first conference. It was about 90 foreign women. I say foreign, you know, non-locals. And uh, it was amazing. And when I stepped out on the platform, heard that voice again that said, this is what I want you to do the second half of your life because I was in my mid-40s. And I was just stunned so much. It was hard to get to the microphone and speak because I mean, it's like a serious calling on my life and a shift. So I resigned what I was doing and began, you know, asked the Lord, talked to a couple of friends that had helped with the conference. And one of them joined me for the next seven years, along with the local gal. And it took off from there. So thank you for sharing that. That's wonderful. Give us a time, like how long did it take approximately from that first time you kind of felt that nudging on the bus to when like the, the person came up to you and said, I'll plan a conference around you. What, what kind of time frame was that approximately? So I think it was in the spring. I heard it in 2005, my four, and then I did nothing. Right. And then September comes and I was like, whoa, okay. So then I started writing. Okay. And then the next April, so it was a year. Okay. And then we did, we had to wait to do the conference because summer was coming. So it was um, October, 2005 that we began. I just asked because sometimes I think it's really helpful when we can hear from someone else's life. It's so easy to fast forward to the end. Oh, that's the good part. Now she gets to do the conferences, right? But to really look and say, that was a year of your life that yeah. there was a lot of in my, what would be for me, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but there would be a lot of sort of like question and answer back and forth. I spent time doing this, still nothing is happening. Now I, some time has passed. I haven't spent time doing it. Like there's a lot of this as we're stepping out in faith. It's just not, I, we want it to be linear, right? Sometimes. Yeah. And so often it's really not. And I just, so I appreciate you sharing with us that, yeah, it was, it was a process, even though, even though you feel like you had heard him very clearly, it still was yeah. a process before well, something came to work. fruition. It is. <laughs> it you is. So sit down and, you know, I'm like you, I really dig deep into the word. And so I did, I wrote out, and and again, I feel like the Holy Spirit just led me because as we see the fruit of that, and then I wrote a Bible study to it four years later because the church asked me to do that. And it's the same thing. I go back and I, I look at this study and I see the transformation. It's called Crown of Beauty 12-Week Bible Study. It's on Amazon. And now we have it in eight languages. And the transformation that comes into people's lives from this, and I still teach it, and I'm still... <laughs> convicted and I'm like did I really write this I mean <laughs> it, it really was a work of the spirit yeah. and um, same with the conferences I've trained women um, all around the world and in different languages they're doing it themselves now they're teaching that I give them the powerpoints and they translate it into Arabic or French or Spanish or Chinese or uh, Bangladesh, or what else do we have? You know, all these different languages, Ugandan languages, they have 32 languages. So <laughs> they just translate orally. But 
um, it's exciting and I know that it's God, but it is hard work. And the, the, I mean, I get what you're saying where I get what you're saying, Angie, is that I, every fall I come and I have nothing scheduled. There's nothing scheduled. And I just go, I don't know what you want me to do, Lord. And I, I, if I start trying to do all the methods that you do and, you know, get the podcast to tell you what to do to get conferences it, it doesn't happen and then he just says you just need to wait on me and you need to pray and and every year it fills up it's been going since 2005 but every year i go through this again and i am once again but then sometimes when it doesn't fill up you go oh you know, one of those times was because my brother passed away. Another time was my stepfather passed away. Now my mother is passing away. And I don't say that lightly. It's really hard. She's just a couple weeks away. Mm -hmm. But it's like, well, of course you would cancel that. You know, and not have anybody sign up. However, I did have to cancel 11 conferences during COVID. <laughs> I did have that yearbook. And, um, but all those people are committed to continue in it. Yeah. Yeah. And I appreciate that. I appreciate you saying that because sometimes we look at other people and their success maybe, and we say, mm -hmm. well, they must not feel that way anymore. They must not have doubt or they must not question God, or they must not have imposter syndrome or whatever the case may be. Uh, but it's refreshing. I think sometimes to be like, no, I don't think it's always easy to look at someone else and f feel yeah. like, well, they have it this way and I have it this way. But so I appreciate your honesty around that, that it's still sometimes a struggle for you. But um, I know that part of your passion then, and we want to talk about this, like is helping women be released from bondage. And I know that that relates in your own life to your own experiences of bondage. And so would you talk to us a little bit about some of the rejection and trauma that has been a part of your life and how it relates to the medical journey that's been a really big part of your life? Sure. So when I was born, I had a severe cleft palate. So I had no nose, no palate, no upper lip all kinds of breathing issues, trachea issues. I had 26 major operations during the first 15 years of my life. The first three years, I pretty much stayed in the hospital. Uh, the doctor sent me home to die after I was born, said we can't help her, we can't get food into her, she's too weak to operate on, she'll die on the table. My mother took me home not to die. She was a pediatric nurse. She had been caring for cleft palate babies for two years because that doctor was the leading doctor for cleft palates in the country. And so she, God had prepared her, she had specialized in that. So when I came along, it didn't freak her out. It was like, well, of course, you know what I'm saying? It was like obvious that that, that was God's plan. So she took me home and found a way to get food into me. And after three months, I was strong enough to go back. And she insisted that the doctor operate and I survived. So the harder thing for me, of course, that was pretty rough physically and a real challenge on our family. But for me personally, it's when I went to school and you can imagine that's when all the teasing begins. Uh, my brothers protected me before that. No neighbor deer crossed the line with me, <laughs> <laughs> but in school, they couldn't do that. So I heard every day, especially from boys that I'm ugly, that I look like a dog, that I'm rejectable, that I'm unlovable. And so I came to believe that deep in my heart, if you hear that enough, despite what my mom would try to affirm me. However, my mother's affirmation and girlfriends really helped me to feel like I was presentable and lovable to women, but I couldn't feel that with men. And so I went into my adult life. Uh, I became a Christian at 15. My mom was a Christian, but she didn't really know how to share that. And she had to work on the weekends. And my dad was not a Christian. So uh, I didn't really grow too much until halfway through college. And then I got involved in um, Campus Crusade for Christ. And that really helped me and graduated and joined their staff and was able to learn and grow a lot. But I found as I got into ministry that I didn't act the same towards men that I did to the women. To men, I was kind of like a drill sergeant. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, well, how are your quiet times? And, you know, that kind of thing. And, and I realized, wow, this is weird because to women, I'm so loving and our women's ministry exploded. It was like three times the size of the men. And 
I was like, something has to be done here, something not right. And so I began to get some counseling that helped and to see the root, you know, of all this. But I, I still didn't understand the thing about the lie. I did understand I was hurt. I had to bring forgiveness into my life to those boys and even to my dad who had left us when I was 11. So I saw, saw a lot of healing and that helped. But it was really, and you'll appreciate this, Angie, being a woman of the word, it really was in my 30s. I was already married, already had young kids, and I was studying Philipp, uh, sorry, Psalm 139, 13, 14. Of course, I was studying the whole psalm, which I loved until I hit 13 and 14. And I, I realized like my whole life, I've been rejecting those verses. It's not mm -hmm. the first time I heard them. In fact, I heard them the very first sermon I ever heard and I rejected it. And see, God was trying to tell me from my beginning of my Christian birth. But anyway, I, I dug deeper into Hebrew and I discovered that fearfully really means that I'm creating the image of God, that I reflect who God is to others. Well, I knew God's beautiful. I knew that he's awesome. I knew that he's wonderful. And wonderful, by the, by the way, I found out meant that we're unique. And so I realized on that day that, oh my goodness, the truth is I can't reject it anymore, that I am fearfully, wonderfully made, that I am a re I'm a reflection of God's beauty and wonderfulness, awesomeness, um, you know, and all the other wonderful talents and gifts and character that I have as a reflection of him. And I'm unique from anyone else. And I'm not a mistake. So I rejected that lie by faith, not by feeling, because I've been hearing all this for so long. So when you look in a mirror, you see something different than what others see. But I'm like, I need to renew my mind, you know, um, Romans 12, 1 and 2, I need to renew my mind. And so I just started doing that. Well, I think I only went, it might even been that day or in that week, I was walking my dog and the voice came back. I suddenly just heard, um, Sue, you are so beautiful to me. And I, I could, I didn't see Jesus, but I knew it was him somehow. I knew it was Jesus' voice. And I just stopped and just started sobbing. <laughs> I was out in public, but I couldn't stop, you know, um, and it just changed my life. And so anytime the enemy tries to throw that lie back at me, I just go back to his, his word and say, I, I'm not accepting that. I'm uh, other people could even think it, you know, I mean, some might, that's just how it is, especially guys, you know, uh, I don't have a certain look or whatever, but to me, it doesn't matter because the smartest one of all is God and the Lord Jesus and our Heavenly Father. And he says, I'm gorgeous. So, hey, that's good enough for me. <laughs> and he's my bridegroom. He's the lover of my soul. And just like I only want to, you know, man, human man wise, I just want to be beautiful in the eyes of my husband, which I am. And my son, he says that too. And my daughter, they're so sweet. And lots of my friends. But I'm just saying, you know, because I have that truth from God and that's what I cling to. I love that. It's so practical and so beautiful the way that you've described that. And I think I, I could feel myself, the tears in the back of my eyes, because I know what it's like. I know that voice too, that thing that you're maybe worried isn't the right word, but that, that deep longing inside you, the yeah. one place that you're not sure you're not sure if you're okay enough in that one place. And the Lord just very personally with scripture and with his love song. I love Zephaniah 317 that talks yeah. about how he rejoices over us with singing and dancing, right? Like, and I have a hard time picking that up. I have a hard time believing that, but he brings it back to me and he reminds me and he says, this is my truth over your life, you know? And that touches that place that you're talking about, that deep longing yeah. for that thing that maybe other people in the world have tried to say, you're not enough right here. And he says, oh no. That's not my, that's not, I'm the smart one, as you said so well, and I say it's otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. You'll appreciate this, um, that verse that you just shared. Uh, when I was getting my master's in counseling, one of our assignments was to write about the most um, shameful moment in our life. 
what a lovely assignment. Yes. So I started doing that and I had actually been um, sexually assaulted in college and that was by far the most shameful thing, but so much so that I had really forgotten it. I mean, I honestly had. And when I started the assignment, I knew that, oh, it was an uncomfortable moment. That's all I can remember. But as soon as I started, it just all came flooding back and all that shame came with it. And I'm crying. I said, Lord, I, I don't, I, I don't even feel like I can look at you. And, and I hear Zephaniah 317. And I didn't know that verse, Angie. I had read it once. Apparently it was underlined, but <laughs> I didn't remember it. And, you know, it's a hard book to find. And I'm like, second, I three, seven, what is that? I look it up and it's what you said, right? How um, he sings a love song over the, over me, right? And that he saves me and all these beautiful messages and his, his love. And I, I, I thought this is the most awful moment in my life. And you're telling me that you're singing a love song and it was so healing and really took all that shame away. Yeah. I appreciate you sharing that. I really do. And I, I, I do identify with that so much because there are just times, like I said, I have a hard time receiving it, but I believe him and I believe his word. And I love what you said before uh, that we can reject the lie by faith, not by feeling. And so mm -hmm. because I believe you, because I believe your word and I believe your promises in your word, I will say, actually, even though I don't feel like I'm worthy of being sung over or that I am fearfully wonderful meat or that I am beautiful or good inside, I don't feel that way right now, but right. I believe it because you say it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, you know, the more that um, you, you're a student of trauma, trauma therapy too. And the more that I learn about that and how God is maiming neurologically that I'm, you know, I had this if somebody even said, oh, did you have a cleft palate? It would trigger that uh, neur neuron would just shoot right to uh, a release of those chemicals that made me sad and depressed. But as I renewed my mind through God's word, it was building a new neurological pathway to a feeling of joy. And so it's a beautiful thing that even he has wired us neurologically through the renewing of our mind. And it's not just positivity, right? When Jesus was tempted in the desert, he didn't just say, oh, go away, Satan, you have no power over me. He, he quoted scripture, there's something powerful and it, and it's anointed and the devil hates it right yes. satan hates the word of god so i really encourage all you know all of our listeners right now of your your community that <clears throat> please you know learn those scriptures yes and i'm not great at memorization but if you get close enough yes you know, then and Poke them out, not just a positive word, not just I'm beautiful, but I'm fearfully, wonderfully made, yes. you know, um, that God sings a love song over me. If you yes. want to quote the, where it comes yes. from, okay, if you're good at numbers, do that. If you're, you paraphrase, do that, but quote the scripture because there's a power behind it as Jesus points out, uh, like he even says, right? Jesus himself says, you shall know the truth. And the truth shall set you free, yeah. right? In yeah. John 8, 32. And so um, that's what he says. It's not just a positive word, but the truth of God's word, you know, and that what you know, the reference for is I was mixing up the one where the, it, it cuts through the marrow. Yes. And, yes. I don't know. know the address off the top of my head, but I know yes. what you're talking about. My yes. Mm -hmm. always used yeah. And yeah. the service like that, yeah. but yeah. yeah, it's very powerful. I love that. I, you know, one of the times when, when the Lord was really helping me understand the lies that I was believing and helping me build a toolbox against that and armor against that, if you will, I remember the first time that I had, I had been doing some better Sue, and I really found myself not doing well, you know, in, a, in right. a, for a few days of this. And I just felt this like sort of infusion of understanding, like, you know how to do this. 
you know how to fight this. And I went inside, I went into the kitchen. I was home alone. Thank goodness. But uh, I went into the kitchen and my little Bible was sitting on the counter of the kitchen and I picked it up and like literally lifted it up. And I said, some of the things that you're saying, I will not believe this, you know? And I said it out yeah. loud because yeah. I am fearfully and wonderfully, because I have been bought with a price because he does sing over me because he's promised never to leave nor forsake me. And I just started rattling stuff off okay. in this, like, um, this string of promises, right. you know, I did not say the addresses, you know, but I, this string of promises and I won't ever forget the physical change in me. Like there was this mm. sort of like release. I think it was kind of that, those, you know, in my brain, that sort of like those, that popping of a different mm. mental, yes, <laughs> yes. And I won't ever forget that. And it taught me something about what you're saying, that there's real power when you speak this out loud. And when, you know, again, to go back to your words that I reject this lie, not by what I'm feeling, yeah. but what I know to be true. Yeah. Yeah. And also, um, you know, this week on, on my podcast, his heartbeat, uh, one of my guests was Rachel McCants and she had a brain tumor, um, and, and had to have surgery and, but just, how God healed her and everything. And she, she wrote a book and it's six steps to, uh, basically like feeling good about yourself more or less. I forget. <clears throat> I'll word, look it up. But yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember number six, uh, six, six steps to find self-worth. I think that's it. So on number six, she said, like, she said all the things we've been saying. Okay. And she said all those. And the, but number six was, um, share your story to others. Mm. And it's really true. People are amazed at what I will say up front. You know, it's very vulnerable in my conferences, but that frees them up to share. So one of the unique things that we do in our conference, which we call Beauty for Ashes, uh, which is different than Crown of Beauty. That's the book. That's the name of our ministry. But the conference itself, Beauty for Ashes, and we have, after we share, we have these four messages or three or two, whatever they have time for. But then they get into small group of about four to five people. And I have this whole list. I can send it to you if you like. You can post it of lies yes. about self and lies about God. And then it's five pages of truths from the scripture to counteract that. But we ask them in the group to underline any of these lies that sometimes the enemy speaks to you, you hear it in your head. And it probably came, you know, all the way back from childhood. We talked about that. It's the first time that that came into your life. And then we're going to pray. And we have these prayers in case people don't exactly know how to pray. But basically, they're just praying. And I reject the lie that blank, you know, I'm ugly. I'm not good enough. I'm uh, useless. I'm worthless, whatever it is. Or the lie about God, because we can believe God, uh, that there's this, when we have trauma in our life or tough times, where was God? Okay, I'm all alone. He abandoned me. He doesn't love me. I'm not good enough. He's punishing me, whatever those lies are. And I reject that in Jesus' name. We have to do it in Jesus' name, the power of Christ. And I accept the truth. And then you state the opposite, the truth that I am. And if you know scripture to put in there, and then we always have a leader. I train the leaders. I send a video. So they're pre-trained like women you choose from your church, whatever. And we, we can bring some people too. And then they pray over them, those truths. And it's so powerful because then they leave with at least one thing that they were able to identify and get some freedom from. I love that. That, that does sound so powerful because when you really allow God again to speak to that, that, that deepest longing, you know, that we yeah. have inside us. Yeah. Yeah. That it's, it's yeah. trans it's, it invites the transformation that only he can do. Yeah. Yeah. So we go all over the, the world with that. You That's know, wonderful. and we go especially to a lot of impoverished areas and where women are really oppressed. Every year I go to Lebanon, Bangladesh, Uganda. Those are three of the biggies. And then as other people invite us, and also in the States. And I don't charge a lot because I'm able to raise support. And um, yeah, it just helped me to get there. And I'm <laughs> 
That's I'm beautiful. all yours. Yeah. Kind of mm-hmm. thing. So. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. This has been fantastic. I just so much appreciate some of the things that you have shared about yourself and your ministry and your passion. Sue can be found at crownofbeauty.com and her podcast, as she said, is called His Heartbeat. And her book is Crown of Beauty, Renewed in His Intimate Love and Delight. And all of that and other places you can find and follow Sue and her ministry will be in today's show notes. And again, I just want to thank you so much for serving us today. Appreciate your time. Thank you so much. I love being with you and with your with your um, listeners. Thank, thank you. you. Yes, and thank you, friend, for listening. Until next time, peace. A big thank you to Sue for sharing her live it out story with us today. Friend, it's so important for us to believe that because we are children of God, we are beautiful. We are created in the very image of God. And I appreciate that reminder from Sue so very much today. Again, our verse this week is Isaiah 61, 3, the first part, hear it in the NIV, and provide for those who grieve in Zion to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. And if you haven't yet, I encourage you to listen to Monday's Take It In episode, where I focus on the word bestow. Next week, our Take It In verse will be 2 Corinthians 1, 3, that reminds us that God comforts us. And my guest will be author and speaker Jody Rosser. Jody joined me to talk about walking through a series of losses, a baby, a marriage, and a dear friend to cancer, and how leaning on Jesus brought comfort and help for her hurting heart. If you haven't yet, I'd be so grateful if you would subscribe or follow the podcast on whatever directory you use to listen. It only takes a second. It helps the show so much, and it guarantees you'll see new episodes as soon as they drop. Thank you so much for listening. I pray wherever your day takes you, you are walking in the confident knowledge that you are a beloved, cherished child of God. Peace.